uh, with 1040 per piece and uh, expecting Tony Brown to join us momentarily. Uh, and uh, Hi, John. Hey, oh, there's Tony. Hey, there he is. Uh, so um, the purpose this evening is to uh, discuss the uh, uh, Martin Luther King speech at Riverside Church whenever he named racism, materialism, and militarism as triple evils, which threaten the very soul of America. So um, in that speech, uh, King said, among other things, war is not the answer. So uh, this evening is really yours for discussion. And uh, uh, when you have a thought to share, simply unmute yourself and uh, speak uh, to the group. And uh, I'm going to ask Tony to say hello to the group and maybe get us started. Well, uh, <laughs> it seems like uh, I've been seeing a lot of you, John, <laughs> lately. I hope not too much. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, tonight, not only to talk about King and uh, and Harding, although uh, I think their lives are very instructive. They were incredible teachers and role models. But also, I'm delighted uh, to be here for conversation that might help us see how we can participate in becoming agents of change ourselves voices who speak out against racism or poverty or militarism. We had our uh, hopes really raised high uh, when slavery ended. We entered into that period called the Reconstruction and uh, they were dashed after a decade and we had a hundred years of Jim Crow. And, and then uh, at the end of that hundred years, we had the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King and his nonviolent movement, which brought the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. But then uh, in the 20th century, we saw some of that dismantled. Uh, but even still with that back and forth manner of living in this country, overall, I think there's been a continued and unrelenting commitment to this struggle, which is moving us forward. The arc of the moral universe is long, but I, I believe like others that it bends toward justice. And so, um, and so I'm delighted to be here. And um, I think we can have at it now because this will be a discussion uh, about where we've been and about where we're going. <laughs> All right, maybe somebody who was on last week didn't say what you wanted to, there's a hand. Go ahead, unmute yourself, Catherine. I, um, Tony, um, I, I wonder uh, and wanted to chat with you uh, maybe and get some feedback from you. Uh, what do you think about the new law that was passed, the voting uh, law that was passed in Georgia? Um, I'm a Canadian, so I have to tell you, I am appalled and disgusted and outraged that that kind of a law could even make it to the floor. Uh, um, but maybe some feedback from you, because to me, well, it's well, I'm, so regressive. I'm with you on being appalled, but a, a part of me is appalled, but a part of me is, um, is not, uh, only because uh, there's a piece of me that says, well, this is, this is business as usual, and that this is a fight that's ongoing, that, that, that we do have to figure out how we can, it's not just Georgia, although <laughs> Georgia got it started. And then yep. there are several states across this country that are trying to repress the vote. 
And, and what was really interesting to me, if you saw the visual, uh, when they, they were signing that law in Georgia, in the background was a plantation. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and so, so there is this push-pull. We, we are in this struggle. And some people are trying to take us back, especially because Republicans don't have the numbers or the policies anymore that are going to really galvanize people, except they do have some very uh, subtle, they're not so subtle, but they, 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 they have the white supremacists and, and they, they, they do have a base, but they don't have the numbers because we are now becoming increasingly with the changing demographics, a multicultural uh, country. And yeah. by 2045, uh, people of European descent will be in the, in the minority. That's frightening. So the only way we can do something about that is to try to do what we can to prevent people from voting. Uh, but I really, um, I mean, I, I don't know what we're gonna do. I do think that that voting should be like it is in Canada, run by the federal government. Yes. I think, <laughs> but and, and just what it's going to take, uh, to make that happen, I'm not sure, but I, I think eventually that's what it's going to be. I, just, I, 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 I hope so. I, 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 I see that uh, real change in the country can only come when someone can walk up to a poll and even if they haven't registered four times in advance to to vote yeah. or whatever the process is, right. Um, right. as in Canada, you can walk up to the poll with your identification get put on the voters list and vote that day and so um i i was appalled to me it just is so regressive well, thank you well, for, for you yeah you cool. you have I mean, my you have really my, my no go ahead i'm sorry i was gonna say you have my my face it is <laughs> i cannot face. give you a bottle of water it's not even subtle i mean it's just no. you know, that's inc incredible. Anyway, just uh, one perspective. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm just as um, aghast as you are about yeah. this. And I think we're just in the middle of it now. And I, 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 I'm not sure what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. But, but I, I'm hopeful. Somehow I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah. I, you are in my prayers, Georgia, <laughs> and all the other states. <laughs> I keep you in my prayers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Tony, is there any evidence that the people of color are galvanized by this kind of thing? That they're brought together and uh, moved to move? On well, it? I think it's, I think there's a multiplicity of ways to feel about it. And there are a multiplicity of temperaments and types of people of color. So I think there are people of color out there who are, who are, I can't speak for all the people of color. So I, you know, but, but I do know this, that, that there will be some who will just, uh, who won't care. Uh, in other words, they don't have, they don't live in hope. They, they, they felt uh, very, uh, very exhausted by all of it. And then I think there are others. I mean, uh, Stacey Abrams, she's a motivator down there in Georgia, and she did some incredible things. So I think there are others who are who are fighting back, uh, who are going to do everything they can to make this right. So I, it's 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 a it's not a they're not the responses are not identical. They're not the same for everyone. But I think people of color are very concerned uh, about it. And um, there are deliberate at attempts and strategies being constructed to see what we can do uh, to change this. It's going to take uh, not just people of color though, it's going to take everybody who cares. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Sure. In response to this, I think that uh, if we talk about the bottle of water, 
if they don't want them to have to take water, they should have enough polling places or ways to do without having these long lines. Then you don't need the bottles of water. <laughs> but to rule out the bottles of water when you need it is pretty stupid. Uh, also, the many of the Republicans want justice for the unborn, and I think that's a good thing. I wish the Democrats would catch on with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they want justice for the unborn, but not for the living. Yes, they do. They want it for the living, too. Certain ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, certain but, ones. But right. the, the Democrats don't want it for the unborn. And they don't do much better for the living. Um, one, Jerry, of the, one of the things about King's speech uh, was that it was controversial. And when he entered into it, he was very conscious of that. Uh, but in your minds, why was it so controversial? Are there comments yeah. on that at Riverside speech? Well, let me raise it a different way or quote a line that he said near the beginning of his speech. He said, <clears throat> we must speak <clears throat> with all of the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. And I wonder if all of us on this call are speaking often or ever about important questions or are we pretty quiet for one reason or another? He said, we must speak. So, so I, I, I will just jump right back in there because I'm not a quiet person. Um, yeah, I do, do want to hear many voices, but go ahead. Yes, please. yes, yes. But I, I just want to say that the reason I think that um, people are challenged or offended or, or worried is because when things um, uh, float away from their comfort zone, it becomes um, disconcerting and nerve wracking. And the very fact that um, the people don't see uh, the UN Charter on Human Rights as the right for every single human being on earth tells you why people are nervous and why they get uncomfortable and why they, they fight back. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's just my thought. And I will always speak up. Catherine, Catherine could, I, could I ask you a question? This is Rick uh, from the, a person who is off our little island here that we live in. Um, I'm often, John talks a lot about, you know, American exceptionalism and, and do you, from your point of view, seeing Americans from across the border, uh, is it your opinion that that's fairly strong or is that just something we, we talk about and could, could it be that that sort of exceptionalism um, makes it hard for us to question? Um, our policies and the things that we do that, you know, we just said it, you know, just a little bit ago, you know, my wife and I talk about it every once in a while. Well, well, gee, we're the good guys. You know, we wear the white hats and ride in and rescue everybody. And yet that's not true. But I just wonder, does the rest of the world see us that way? Um, so um, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, and feeds into the fact that I've actually had an opportunity to visit five continents and uh, 43 countries, um, some of them many, many times. Um, I uh, can assure you that that notion of American exceptionalism is a very American notion. It is not necessarily held by the world. And certainly uh, we in Canada often sit back and, and scratch our heads at, at the things that we see as not that not that we're perfect by a long shot. We've got we've got things we need to work on as well. But when say for instance a, a president like Donald Trump can can become president 
can be so divisive, so angry, spread so much hatred. And 72 million people, wasn't it, still voted for him? We don't understand that. And, and there may be a pocket of Canadians that get it, but in general, we don't, we don't understand that. And when you have instances such as that, or um, gun laws, another um, weapons of mass destruction should not be in the hands of individual people. I don't care what the Second Amendment says. That is not what the intention was. If everybody wants to own a musket under the Second Amendment, then go for it, because that's what the guns were in the day. But we look at this and we see the, the mass shootings and the mass destruction that occurs, and we don't understand it. And, and the worst part is because there is a concept of American exceptionalism that is held within the nation, it is often very hard to be critical, to be self-critical, uh, not everybody, because I have many American friends, I spend a lot of time in New York, but many people have a very difficult time uh, seeing themselves as um, flawed. Let's just say that, you know. Thank you, Catherine. And Canadians, Canadians think we're always flawed. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's interesting. Anyway, thanks for the question. Uh, someone else was trying to come in. Just unmute yourself and begin to speak. Okay, well, I, I was trying to come in. It was a while ago when the question was, why was Martin Luther King's speech so controversial at the time? Right. And I think, I, I remember that speech. I was active in both the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement as a young college student and then a very young adult. Um, so I remember when that happened, and I think part of it was that at that time, and even still today in some ways, the military was one of the avenues that people of color could use to get an education, get, get a leg up a little bit when other opportunities were not available. And there were obviously in the Vietnam War, there were a huge number of African American soldiers. And I think it was it was definitely controversial within the black community for Dr. King to come out with that. And I think that was that was one of the reasons. Right. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, the first speaker's comment about the um, uh, those like in Georgia who are restricting rights, uh, their, their numbers being limited because we are a more diverse country. The problem is they get around those limitations through gerrymandering. And the, the question is, I guess, how are we going to uh, how are we going to uh, undo gerrymandering? Uh, because I don't think we're going to make much progress until we address that question. All right, thoughts on that? I know people are working on it in Pennsylvania, uh, trying to address that. but they haven't made progress. And gerrymandering has given us a Republican uh, legislature <clears throat> and uh, they aren't giving up on that. We'll probably have a showdown at the end of, uh, at the end of trying to redistrict because we're gonna, we'll probably lose one, uh, one district. Uh, from our, because of our census uh, going down. So this will be between the Republican legislature and Governor Wolf and it might end up in the Supreme Court. But uh, there isn't any independent body yet. And we haven't made any progress on that because of, because of a legislature which has been gerrymandered in on the Republican side. <laughs> Hmm. 
And other thoughts on King's uh, courage uh, to d make a controversial speech? Why I come from a background that is not Mennonite. I was grafted in. So I had the misfortune of serving in the, the armed forces during the Vietnam War. Uh -huh. and, saw, and saw firsthand uh, what was going on and how it was and how it was proceeding. Um, I was stationed at Travis Air Force Base in California, and one of the duties on the night shift was we had to take care of the mortuary, and that was the bodies that were coming back from from Vietnam. And one night we uh, we got so many bodies in during the uh, sweep of the Asha Valley that uh, we had to stand guard overnight over the bodies that couldn't fit into the mortuary. That was a defining moment for me. I decided that there was something definitely wrong with this picture. And fortunately, when I went to the service, I had um, some physical problems, a bad knee, and I messed it up even further in the service. So I got out of there in 11 and a half months. So God was on my side even then. Um, but I made a decision then that this was a wrong thing. But MLK did that much before this. You know, He had the courage to stand up in the face of not American exceptionalism like this, just nationalism or national pride, or uh, I don't know what, what they called it back then, but if you spoke out against the war, um, you were something other than a real American. And uh, his courage to do that kind of thing, well, his whole life was full of courage, you know, and it's just something that uh, I wish I could even approach. Thank you. <clears throat> Another big thing in this country was anti-communism at that time. That had everybody scared to death. We were doing, uh, you know, schools had their places where you could dig in and it was ridiculous. Yeah, King spoke to communism. He said, uh, he called for revolution of values, and he said, a revolution of values is our best defense against communism. War is not the answer. Communism will never be defeated by the use of atomic bombs or nuclear weapons. Let us not join those who shout war and through their misguided passions, Urge the United States to urge the United States to relinquish its participation in the United Nations, and so forth. So, uh, in the Riverside speech, uh, King definitely addressed that thing of uh, of uh, communism and and said uh, the capitalism that uh, this country represents is not going to. Uh, be an, any kind of adequate answer to communism. I wonder if King had given this speech three or four years later, if it might have been better received, uh, because by that time the war was much less popular. And there was actually quite a strong anti-Vietnam War movement within the military itself. And there were many African-American soldiers that were part of that. So I think, you know, I, I, I think uh, the climate of the country uh, and the understanding had changed uh, considerably over the course of the war. But of course, King saw the, um, with much more clarity, uh, saw this earlier than many other people did. And I agree that it took a lot of courage on his part to, to speak out so clearly. In, in regard to the, the Georgia voting law, which is appalling to me, like to probably practically all of us, um, I find myself, well, in two positions, somewhat hopeful that some businesses have opposed it and that apparently a fairly large number of CEOs are getting together to talk about what they can do about similar laws to <laughs> oppose them as they come up in other states. Um, and then I think I'm probably being naive to 
to be encouraged by that because it may be just a flash in the pan and it'll go away and nothing much will come of it. But it seems to me like those companies have a lot of power and that if we can get some of them lined up against gerrymandering, for example, as something that may be behind the movement to suppress the vote in so many states, maybe that will be some help. Uh, I don't know. Maybe someone can tell me if I'm being naive or if that is a slightly encouraging sign. Well, I think it's an encouraging sign as well, Jenny. Um, I was, I mean, I don't know the answer. I, I, in response to your question of our speaking, John, I feel like we are speaking many times and to many issues. Um, it, it feels a little, um, it's hard to, find hope in it actually. And so um, for me, um, I mean, I do really feel hope in the um, work right, being right down by right now by Black Lives Movement and um, uh, other, uh, the Black Lives Matter group and, and others that are really working on, on working at dismantling racism. But to work at these issues that King, um, I mean, racism, militarism and, uh, and materialism, you know, we haven't talked about that one, but that is huge. And the country depends on um, people spending money. And it is such, a, it hurts our environment, it hurts individuals. Uh, we are, it's so out of control. Um, I, I, when I think of, of King and that speech, um, I just feel like he was such a prophet, such a man of God speaking so wisely um, at that time, and he was not well received by many. And I think tying militarism and materialism um, in with racism was just uh, too too much for many people, uh, and many people that had supported him uh, up until that time. But I think it's right on, and I want to be a part of. I want to be one of the voices that continues to keep these things at the forefront. But it just um, it's, it's difficult for me. Uh, after I, I felt like the Beyond Vietnam presentation that you had was so excellent. And at the conclusion of that, I wanted this very thing that you're doing. Let's talk about what we can do. Um, so I, I'm all for it, but um, I just wanted to share, share that it, um, I feel like many people are doing things, but it, it doesn't feel very focused, except for the uh, dismantling racism work that's being done right now, which is awesome. But what do we think? Can we dismantle racism if we fail or actively refuse to address materialism slash capitalism and militarism slash war? If we, if we fail to do what King did, are we going to be any more successful in addressing racism than uh, the civil rights movement was to to uh, settle the issues. King said this all, hold, it sticks together. And uh, he said, we do have a choice. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people can talk about King's uh, uh, speech where he said, we have a dream. But in this speech, <clears throat> he said, uh, we have a choice today. We still have a choice today. Nonviolent coexistence or violent co annihilation. Who wants to talk about that choice? He also talked about the basis of what all this came was from his Christianity, his belief in Jesus, and trusting that God had a better way. And I think there's just as much argument to go for more weapons and more stuff, unless you have that basis. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I, I, so my discipline is anthropology, and um, over the years, I've I've had the honor of of teaching many young minds and. My work has been uh, primarily in Cuba, my research and my teaching, I take students to Cuba. And one of the things that we, we talk about is this concept of race. And, and we actually, we begin to talk about racializing behaviors because we are humans. We are, we are but humans. We are humans in God's eyes, we are humans with minor genetic variations that account for skin color, hair color, all kinds of things. The negative things that have happened to us, uh, my mother's family is indigenous, uh, the Cree people in the north of Saskatchewan. Uh, my mother was a residential school survivor and the things that happened to my mother didn't happen because she was a, a different race. She was human. She was, a, she was fully human but happened because of the impacts of imperialism, colonialism, uh, the European uh, uh, eagerness to uh, go out into the world and to take over land so that they could get resources and all those sorts of things. I think before we can dismantle this concept of racism, we have to dismantle the ideology behind racism. And we have to begin to discuss that we are all humans, that these are minor genetic variations. They occur in populations, depending, you know, mutations happen in populations. But that the 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 things that we assign as race, we are in complete control of. We can change those things. And and my my heart says that perhaps in the US, I know in Canada, there's still a lot of resistance to removing that that term and those terms from our vernacular anyway that's just my thought mm -hmm. my understanding is that darwin was a very strong racist and this was how survival of the fittest and obviously we whites are the fittest. And he actually recommended limiting the Aborigines in uh, Australia and the blacks in Africa so they don't use all the resources that we whites need. And that was, uh, uh, came right through all the way through. Uh, we annihilated most of the Native American Indians here in the US. And I just heard today that there's talk about giving the national parks back to the Native Americans who will do a better job of running them and also make some reparations. And I think that's something we can get behind and uh, help encourage people to understand that that is wise in so many ways. Yeah. Well, I think there are people here who could respond to uh... Darwin's emphasis on uh, survival of the fittest. Uh, he's been challenged on that. Who are the fittest? There's fitness in cooperation, some researchers are discovering. And uh, there's a lot of survival in uh, cooperation. And uh, so Darwin's human as he was, took his thing further than it really could go. And that's what we're all inclined to do, I guess. Well, can't we just all agree that Darwin has been totally repudiated? I mean, it's quite obvious. So, yeah, it's substantially uh, repudiated. Why should we talk about that? Well, I would say that the fittest are those with a Christian disposition uh, who are fair, who believe in justice, and it doesn't make any difference what color their skin is. But as far as uh, the, uh, the racism that we face, I think 
the the approach has to be multiple. I I'm in West St. Paul, Minnesota, and our state House of Representatives did a study uh, after the George Lloyd Floyd uh, shooting here, and uh, it was a select committee on racial justice, and they came up with a list of problems and 80 recommendations, 80 recommendations. These don't happen overnight, but I think they're advanced when, when we see people of color on our TV sets, delivering the news, making news. Uh, they're, they're entertainers. They are superb athletes. Uh, more and more, they are becoming part of our life and I think as we get to know them, uh, I think that's part of the answer that uh, uh, that knowledge, that personal knowledge uh, breaks down a lot of barriers, I think. So the solution is not going to be simple, I don't think. We're also um, in a in a country where there are other religions. Um, Buddhism, I think, is the fastest growing one. And then, of course, increasingly, there are numbers of Muslims that are in our country. And, and I think many of them, at least the ones I know, are people of such goodwill and who possess such religious discipline that they're teaching they're teaching me how to be Christian in many ways and I think the, I think we have to figure out ways of crossing these divides uh, that we we're not so inclined to want to understand. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Uh, are we going to buy Christian supremacy uh, to replace white supremacy? Um, white supremacy built, I think, pretty much on the structure of Christian supremacy, ideologically. Here in Reading, Pennsylvania, two of the most uh, successful entrepreneurs, and also one of them has been recognized nationally for his philanthropic uh, activities. And also one of my best friends who is uh, Karima, who is a Muslim woman and super active in so many of our organizations, uh, Protection for Women, the group that I belong to, the Intercultural Alliance, and uh, NAACP and whatever. She, she's one of the grandest and, and most gracious women that I know. So uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, we're fortunate to have Muslims here in, uh, in Reading who are very well respected. <clears throat> King uh, quoted a Muslim, uh, I'm sorry, a Buddhist leader in Vietnam about the midpoint or a little beyond midpoint of his speech. Uh, <clears throat> he quoted what he, a great Buddhist leader of Vietnam who said each day the war goes on, the hatred increases in the heart of the Vietnamese and in the hearts of those of humanitarian instinct. The Americans are forcing even their friends into becoming their enemies. It is curious that the Americans who calculate so carefully on the possibilities of military victory do not realize that in the process they are, are incurring deep psychological and political defeat. The image of America will never again be the image of revolution, freedom and democracy but the image of violence and militarism. So that was King quoting a Buddhist leader 50 years ago. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think Buddha was seeking truth 
his answer was empty yourself. And I think Christ had the same answer, but he was able to fill that void. And I think Christian supremacy has fallen terribly short. Jesus Christ supremacy, I still think is important. And I find the Native Americans that I've worked with, and I've worked in six states with 11 tribes, their native religion was more Christ-like than what most of the Christians coming from Europe had. And they called it Christianity. Yeah, actually the uh, Buddhist who uh, King was referring to was uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, mm -hmm. uh, who was a, a wonderful, wonderful Buddhist poet, philosopher, uh, writer, also an admirer of Jesus. Um, but it, my own experience living in Vietnam as a CO and, and in the middle of the war and watching how the people around me responded, I, you know, I, I learned that very often the, it was the Buddhists who were exhibiting the pacifism that often wasn't coming from the Christians. Um, and when I looked for where the fruits of the spirits were, was being exhibited in people's lives, um, very often it was from the Buddhist community, not necessarily from the Christian community around them. Right. Doug, I, appre I appreciated your introducing me to uh, Thich Nhat Hanh in those years. I'd never heard of him, but he seemed to speak more clearly Christ's words. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, my, my own experience uh, after no longer being accepted as a pastor in the Mennonite church because I came out as gay was that I found here in the States, in the pagan community, uh, radical fairies among um, gay people and paganism uh, beyond that, that I often found much more compassion and peace and justice concern among the pagan believers uh, in paganism than, than I did among some of my own brothers and sisters within Mennonitism. And that, that shook me pretty deeply. Uh, I had to come off uh, Mennonites in my Mennonite background and training pedestal and uh, realized that I had an awful lot to learn about brothers and sisters and other spiritual traditions. I, I appreciate this conversation this evening. Yeah, thank you, Keith Schrag. It might be useful if we'd say our names and people probably see them on the screen, but Doug Hostetter spoke a little bit ago there. Uh, does anybody think that if Jesus uh, told a story or parable of a good Samaritan today, that that Samaritan would be other than a Muslim, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu. <laughs> oh my. Oh my, go for it. <clears throat> I heard Myron Augsburger talk last week about that story. The question that uh, he asked is, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, love your neighbor as yourself, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. His question was, who is my neighbor? Myron Augsburger said, Jesus asked, wasn't answering that question. His answer, who was the neighbor? Who are you neighbor to? Not who is your neighbor? And uh, he had to admit that that was the right approach. <laughs> So it's Catherine here. Um, interestingly, uh, I think one of the things that often gets lost in these discussions is that Jesus was in fact a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. Um, Christianity followed from him. Um, when he spoke about his neighbor, he, he was, I believe, speaking to all of the people who were around him, um, that he didn't necessarily make the separation based on you know, uh, just those who were within his immediate surroundings, but even uh, people who had 
different uh, paths to faith, uh, as I believe that there are many paths to God, um, I believe that he wanted us to embrace everyone with an honest faith and, and, and that he would not have made those differentiations. So that's just my, my sense. Thank you. Exactly. And we are not to judge. He's our judge. This is Doug Luganville here. I'm, I'm wondering, curious about whether we have a sense of whether or not our Mennonite church, and I don't know if everybody here is, has a connection to the Mennonite church or not, but wondering if our Mennonite church today is helping to create followers of Jesus who, um, who are following in footsteps of, of King and of Jesus and and how, how well are we doing at that? And what can we do to help prepare people who are seekers of, of peace in the world? How are we doing? You, you are elders of the church. Most of the folks that I see on here this evening are elders of the church. And us younger folks can learn a lot from our elders if we listen well. And I appreciate hearing your stories and your connections with that, that period of time in Vietnam. But uh, yeah, I'd be just curious to, to see if folks have ideas of how the church, the Mennonite church, can um, further this work of nonviolence, of peace, of moving beyond militarism. King advocate, advocated uh... Uh, conscientious objection to uh, military service in that speech. Of course, he was not a Mennonite. Uh, he was in conversation a little bit, I guess, with Mennonites, a lot with people like uh, uh, his uh, speechwriter uh, for this uh, Riverside speech. But he's Vincent Harding. Yeah, Vincent. Um, King said, as we counsel young men concerning military service, we must clarify for them our nation's role in Vietnam and challenge them with the alternative of conscientious objection. Um, so, of course, there's no military draft today, except our dollars are drafted. Today's April 15. Most Americans uh, know what happens that day most years. We make our contribution to the war effort. Uh, so what do we think about conscientious objection to paying for war? In, in the letter we sent off today, uh, one of the things my wife and I said, that we are concerned in a particular that a future court may find us in violation of international laws pertaining to war crimes perpetrated by the US government in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Yemen, etc. So war crimes, is that what we're paying for? And we also said, who knows, given the terrorist nature of warfare itself, by paying this tax, we may be guilty of donating for the support of a terrorist organization as defined by US laws in recent years. So, you know, you can't be too careful about supporting a terrorist organization, can you? Of course, we were trapped this year, uh, didn't end up owing something at the end uh, to the government. So in that sense, couldn't withhold even the uh, symbolic 1040, $10.40. 
but we're raising our voice. We do something. Uh, what what do we do? That's an ongoing challenge. I was pleased to read this week the um, uh, article in the uh, uh, Sojourners um, on their website. Uh, go to sojo.net, sojo, S-O-J-O dot net. Uh, I was pleased that the Sojourners uh, decided to do an article on, uh, on war tax resistance. It's very, very well written and uh, uh, gives a good, good perspective. And I think it communicates well what uh, conscientious objection might mean for the 21st century. It's, it's, it's a great dilemma between uh, the business of, of a person or an individual action about which we can usually make ourselves feel pretty good on the one hand. And on the other hand, making some impact on public policy and, and a policy change, which uh, seems a lot bigger. So, uh, but I don't think in the end it's an either or, but what do you all think? I'm not sure what I think right now. Um, way back during the Vietnam War for, I guess it was maybe three years or so, my husband and I didn't pay our income taxes. We filed, we didn't enclose the check when we owed instead of getting something back. And we wrote a little note explaining why and it, relating it to the Vietnam War and how wrong that was. Um, after a few years, the religious group that I then belonged to, which was kind of a, a dissident Quaker group, um, we came to the conclusion, others came to it first and eventually I accepted it, that when Jesus answered the question about paying the tax to the Romans and said, give to the Romans what's, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give God what belongs to God. Um, it kind of made what we were doing perhaps not quite right. Um, I'm not sure what I would think about that now if I re-examined it and went into it deeply again. We haven't withheld taxes since then. Um, a lot of Part of me would really love to, but I don't know if it's right or not. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, a lot of people got in the wrong kind of help from that uh, scripture text, uh, treating it as if uh, Jesus said something like, well, you got God and you got Caesar. It's about a 50-50. Give them each <laughs> their half. <laughs> well... Render to God what is God's and to Hitler what is Hitler's. Uh, mm. That's the way it sounded to those people, uh, you know, and uh, so it's not any 50-50 deal. Jesus really just restated the question. He didn't give us a slick answer telling us to pay Caesar what, what he wants. Well, I certainly, um, hi, I'm Marty. Um, I, in answer to Doug's uh, question about whether the church is um, speaking to youth about uh, conscientious objection and um, a position on militarism, I, I think we fall short of that. I mean, I can, can't speak for all congregations, but uh, certainly not, <laughs> but uh, certainly ours, we have not talked about it. Um, I think, um, as you said, John, we don't have a draft and that tends to be the time that we really um, work on this. But I think, I think the young people today are, are more involved in, they will be, if we can start talking about it and teaching, looking at where our government spends money and 
Well, I think it's great to to uh, not pay your taxes. I, I really do. I respect that. But I I think we should have a loud voice to the government, and and help other people to see that having over nine hundred million dollars in a military budget is is just it's ludicrous. It's harmful. It's sinful. Um, and if we could have a a way to get lots of voices to talk about this. And I do think our young people um, will care about that. So there are ways in which, I mean, I think one of the problems that the Mennonite church tends to have, I think, if I can be so bold, is we have not wanted to be political. And I think we are recognize not everybody, but well, I certainly think we should be involved in, in speaking to politics and speaking to what is, uh, is happening. Um, the other thing, I just also in talking about uh, the fact that we have more people of color in television and all kinds of things like that, which is awesome, but I, we have to look at systemic racism. We have to look at the things that are keeping, that are denying people equity. And those are the things we have to uncover. And we have been hit, they have been so hidden from us for all these years. And now they're a little more out there. We can discover them but we have to go about uncovering them and being persistent about it so that we truly can bring change. So I know I covered a lot of topics there, but those are my thoughts. And I just piggyback on your thoughts, Marty, and that, uh, that uh, regarding youth, uh, it's my sense that, uh, that the youth are going to be uh, very interested in, uh, in climate, uh, the, the climate crisis, if they aren't ready. Uh, I personally think we're in a climate of emergency. Uh, I think if King were alive today, he would say that, uh, uh, which, which is true, that uh, one of the great uh, uh, polluters in our world today is, uh, is the military. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it seems to me that uh, right around the corner, if it's not here already, and I believe it is, uh, we're going to have to deal with this uh, climate climate emergency, uh, and uh, it's going to it's going to uh, hit us whether we want it to show up or not. And uh, we've pretty much been in denial about it because we're dealing with all kinds of other uh, emergencies, shall we say, uh, including police brutality and all kinds of things that that, that emerge. But the climate crisis is going to be uh, real for maybe not for those of us who are uh, in uh, as, who are presently senior citizens, but uh, certainly our children and and definitely our grandchildren are going to be uh, affected by it. And so I think that is going to make a big difference uh, uh, in terms of even even. Uh, um, uh, I don't know how it'll affect racism exactly, but I think it will affect militarism uh, in, a, in, a, in a big way. Um, and uh, for, for us to just call out the military to try and put out forest fires or like they're doing in Lancaster now, uh, having the National Guard give, uh, give uh, uh, vaccinations, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not going to, to work for the climate crisis. I'm increasingly impressed with the uh, not only the interconnection of militarism and materialism and racism, but uh, also the, the 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 aspect of fear in all of this. And that's where it hits me personally. Uh, I, I can be involved in numerous ways on, on these major critical issues, all of which we've been mentioning, and I think are really critical. And yet, for me personally, the, the question comes, uh, what is it that I'm afraid of? And um, fear is something that, that Jesus often uh, really uh, expressed his approach to was peace, be still, do not fear, do not be afraid. And yet, for instance, in, in what we call this pandemic or the COVID crisis, uh, I see that, that most of us have been really uh, bound up in a lot of fear. What if? What if? And um, I, I see that, that that, of course, in any crisis, the people who suffer most are the poor people, the people who aren't uh, 
of the, the dominant race or the dominant creed. And uh, we, we again, uh, by our, our rules, impose a you know, white supremacy of patriarchy of, uh, of restrictions on all people. Uh, and yet it seems to me that, that at the base of all this is, is fear, whether it's fear of death or fear of illness. And how does the peace of Christ help me personally and help us as a congregation or as denominations? Um, how, does it, how does it help us? And uh, I don't know that we're ready to, to address that part tonight, but I, I think then it becomes not only a, a global or cosmic issue, but a, a very deeply personal one that's personal every day. Um, and to what degree is my safety dependent on, on statistics that the that, that are put out by CDC or by local governments or state governments? Um, and to what degree uh, is my fear and my sense of security based on, on quote, official reports? And they, of course, uh, as any statistic is, comes from a, a very big bias and uh, isn't really representative of, of different races and uh, minorities. But uh, it's a very complex issue, and yet in some ways, it's something that's deeply personal and, and that I think I have a lot of control over, and that, that is my own response. I can't control how the military uh, does its work, or even how the legislature, and, and I've done all kinds in my life of, of uh, witnessing in person in DC and in letters and, and withholding tax money and so on. Uh, and yet in some ways, I think as I look back on my lifetime now, uh, that the, the personal question that really hits me at the core of my being is, am I afraid or am I at peace? Which for me gets back to square one on this. So Keith, thank you for your, your insights here. That's very meaningful. Uh, the square one for me is uh, where, did the, where did Jesus go? Uh, uh, where did King go when he, when he saw what was uh, the, the triple challenges of racism, militarism, and, and materialism? Where did he go? Did he go back to uh, where he came from and just live a quiet life? Uh, did Jesus go back to Galilee and, uh, and just finish his life as a carpenter? What was it? What was it? in both King's life and Jesus' life that made them, in the case of Jesus, made Jesus go to Jerusalem and face what he had to face there. And why did King go to the Riverside Church and give this speech that he knew he was, he, he was afraid he knew that what might happen to him. Jesus knew what might happen to him. And yet they did it. Yet they did it. And why did they do it? What, what drove them? What spirit? I think to Jesus, it was very clear. This was the will of his father in heaven. And I think King had the same basis. And as far as our militarism, we're doing a great job in this country. We just got our fifth department of war now in space, which we already have to prepare for war in space. But we don't have a department of peace. We don't want to study peace. All we study is war. Now, that's not totally true, but the basis of our country's economy and all so on is based on war, not peace. All right, um, now you all are gonna decide uh, how long we go here. <laughs> and uh, we can quit in five minutes, we can go 20 minutes, but uh, keep speaking if you have things to say.
Well, this is Pat Brady. Um, you know, one of You're the things I wanted. Night, to... Pat, I know you. <laughs> yeah, what, so... wanted to to go back to a couple of things that people said, maybe Marty and, and Jenny, back to the economics and the corporations, back to the Georgia voting, etc. And to me, and as part of 1040 for Peace, it really delves into economics. And how do you influence the government through the economics? And you can do it for withholding taxes, et cetera, but you can also do it by your choices on supporting different um, corporations, economic uh, venues or, or ventures and which ones are just and which ones are not. Mm -hmm. And to me, the model that worked so well in South Africa with the boycott divestment mm -hmm. sanction is something that I think is what's going to be needed in the United States. And mm -hmm. it will not, racism, systemic racism will not end until that economic pressure forces it to go and and things like you know those corporations kind of divorcing themselves from the racism is a start but we have a long way to go but that's what drove the change in south africa and we need some major influence like that to change it in the united states and until the economics justify it we will keep doing what benefits the corporations and, and the corporate government, and that is racism. Racism pays right now. We have to make it not pay. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, what about Amazon? Should we buy it from Amazon? Yeah. <laughs> Right, it's not easy. I mean, the, yeah. with the choices we have, yeah. you know, to be able to live. But there are, you know, a lot of us here are retired and have investments. You have choices in what to do with those investments. There are equitable companies and there are ones for profit and you have to work to try and find, is this a green company? Is this a justice-based company? Or is this strictly whatever's running the profit? And you have to try and do your best. Yeah. Actually, it's been encouraging that uh, the National Baseball League uh, took the All Star game out of uh, out of Atlanta because of the. Uh, restrictive uh, voter laws and that many uh, corporations now have also been coming out um, against those kind of things. So I think um, there is an awareness that um, money speaks and um, that boycotts can work if people really get behind it and, um, uh, and say we will not allow our money to be used to further racism or militarism. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. A good, a good example of that, I believe, is the Great War Cup way back. It worked. Mm -hmm. my, my kids didn't know what a grape was until they were maybe eight or so, my oldest. <laughs> All right. Now, what are you wishing you would have said if this thing ends and you didn't say it? <laughs> are there coalitions out there that um, people can um, coalesce with, uh, work with, uh, join in the efforts to do some, they're involved in trying to restructure some things and they're already uh, already established and organized. Might, might 
there be some wisdom in uh, making some connections that way. For sure, good. Have any particular uh, projects or movements in mind, Tony or others? I think William Barber would be one um, and a very viable, good one. <clears throat> His is a <clears throat> multiracial, uh, so it involves lots of poor people. <laughs> of all stripes and colors. <clears throat> yeah, Poor People's Campaign. All um, right, go ahead. Sorry, I was, I was just gonna throw in something because I, I realized the Canadian political landscape is very different than the American political landscape but I, I wonder, um, uh, you know, we recently, I live in Alberta and recently the government passed uh, something. It, they have a majority in the legislature and they passed something in the province that just offended probably 90% of the population. And as a coalition, we were uh, able to come together, uh, people from all political backgrounds uh, religious, ethnic diversity, that we were able to come together and to stop that. Uh, they've actually reversed the policy and um, they're going to um, reconsider the entire, it was around the environment. But I, I wonder why it is, my sense is that in the U.S. it's much more difficult to put that kind of pressure on legislatures that they, um, like Georgia, I, I don't understand that. I come back to Georgia because it's so appalling to me, but I see other things that happen as well. Is there mm -hmm. not a way to harness um, people's um, anger? I mean, 72 million voted for the one guy, but 84 million people voted for the other guy to harness that and, and to, to uh, bring about change um, that way. It's work though, it's hard work. <laughs> yes. Well, this is Richard Herschler. And I think the Democrats and Republicans are two sides of the same coin and we need a third way. Well, yeah, I think the church should be more political and less partisan. Let's we'll start with what, what we should be doing. People in general be engaged, but not starting with some party that's uh, only in small ways different from another party. Okay, Tony, what do you think? Is people ready to go home or do they have more to say? Maybe this is, uh, maybe this is step one. Well, we got to hope it isn't the last step. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, we've got to hope that something, some germ of truth, motivation, energy, or courage was uh, nurtured this evening. All of us, or at least most of us, so that we'll be more ready to go and do what we should do, what we're able to do, not less, not more. So uh, I think we'll wind it up. If we ever have another discussion like this, uh, well, you'll, if it's sponsored by 1040 for Peace, you'll find it on our 
little website. We're a local organization aspiring to be international. So <laughs> help us do that. Yeah. Joanna Shank said something interesting the other day. She said, what does it mean to be accountable? What are the structures I need to be about restructuring? Um, how do I help to generate power to create new systems? And we can actually not do any of that by ourselves. We must, and I think that was the genius of Martin Luther King, is that he had a multiracial coalition that brought people together and helped to move the country forward with the help of some legislation too but but how do we how do we join hands and try together to move things forward yeah that's the ongoing challenge i think because we can't just do it by ourselves and we can't just uh think uh, only in terms of our congregation, although that's an important place to start. We have to link hands with people across divides of race, sexual orientation, religion. It's a, <laughs> to build these coalitions to create something new. And- If I can just add one thing to that, Tony, um, I think the, a question that I think all of us need to ask to be a part of that is what am I willing to give up? Uh -huh. Whether it's a way of thinking, a way of being, uh, whether it's making more money in my investments or um, yes. getting there sooner, all, you know, all of these things, all of these issues that are big crises, all of us have to be willing to give something up. And again, many things, really, you know, and so I, I just think we always have to keep that on, in our minds. You know, what yeah. am I willing to, is this something I'm willing to give up and be willing to give things up? Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Maybe those are some good concluding thoughts we just heard there. Um, I was reading uh, C.T. Vivian on on King today, and Vivian said King um, was, um, he never uh, made that sort of dichotomy or choice between on the one hand, the way of love, and on the other hand, having some power. He said, love is actually superior power, so we should be afraid of a little power talk, power makes things change, and we want to see things change for the better. And so uh, let's uh, go with the King, C.T. Vivian, and uh, Vince Harding, and uh, embrace the superior power of love. Well, do something good uh, to yourself, for your family, and your world tomorrow, and uh, until we gather again, uh, be well. Nice to meet you all. Night. Yep. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Thank you.